So we are in our last session on conversations journeying with Jesus through Holy Week. So we've gone through, my goodness, so many different conversations, um, beginning with our very early on with Jesus at the beginning of his journey towards Jerusalem and leading us all the way to Holy Week. So we have multiple conversations that I want to try to cover today, but I also have a fun project for us to work on as well, um, which I actually did with another congregation. And I was, um, if you know Hannah Faye Allred, I did it with her church a few weeks ago, and I was like, oh, this is so much fun. I want to do it with, with us. So we're going to do a little bit of art making um, in a little bit. And our everybody online, um, all you'll need are scissors and colored paper. So um, if you don't have those, if, if you can see if you have some, um, grab them, that'd be wonderful. We're gonna start with our prayer for today, consider some of the scriptures of Holy Week and the conversations that happened during that week. Um, read some of that scripture and then do um, a special Palm Sunday prayer writing and art making. So thinking about talking with God, we've been doing a lot of talking with each other over the last few weeks. So now we're going to turn towards what it looks like to talk with each other, but also talk with God. Anybody feel very prayerful today and like to read our prayer? You can see it as a thrower. God in highest heaven, how humbly you enter our world to reign. In Christ Jesus, on dusty road, riding a donkey. Help us to pave the way for your eternal realm with our prayer and praise, with our service and love, until the very stones cry out at the coming of your new creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to ask you all, what words immediately come to mind when you think of Holy Week? Could be anything at all, descriptions, adjectives, nouns, whatever you can think of to describe Holy Week. I'm going to write you something. Sacred. What? Sacred. Sacred, yes. The cross. The cross. The Last Supper. The Last Supper. Yeah, that's, that's one. Jesus entering into Jerusalem. Jesus entering Jerusalem. Great sadness and joy. Great sadness and joy, right? These two dichotomies. Denial. Denial. Betrayal. Betrayal. Suffering. Suffering. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, yes. Great right, so far. Any other words that come to mind when you think of holy? What? The time in between. There's a lot of waiting, right? And a lot of little interactions that we don't always think about as much as the big, you know, cross resurrection. Betrayal. Betrayal. Yeah. Oh, we got that times two. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. It's okay. It's, it's... <laughs> Grace and glory. Grace and glory. All right, this is a lot of great scriptures. Um, you know, I think there's, if we were to go through every single day, we would have such a variations or gradation of different words and scriptures um, for each of the days, but this is a, a wonderful start. Thank you. So we're going to read, um, since today is Home Sunday, we're going to start with that um, and read the full um, text that we'll be looking at today for this conversation. And then we'll move to consider some of the other conversations throughout Holy Week. Um, so we have three slides for this. So we're going to do one through three, four through seven, and eight through 11. Um, anybody feel like starting this off with our, our first, first verse? 
When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. Hey, thank you, Caroline. All right, we're gonna to move to four through seven. Someone else can read this. They went away and found a cold tide near a door outside in the street. They were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing? Tying the cold? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. And they brought the cold to Jesus and threw their clothes, their clothes on it, and he sat on it. Wonderful, thank you, Karen. And then 8 through 11. <coughs> Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Beautiful. Thank you, Ed. So we have several different conversations going on here. Who, who counted up our conversations? What are all the interactions, all the different characters going on in these conversations? Well, first, Jesus uh, gives instructions. Yeah. Exactly. So he's talking. Yeah, telling them what what is it that's supposed to do? What are we doing here? Yeah, absolutely. So we have these instructions. Then what's the next sort of conversation? David, say, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why are you taking my donkey? What's going on here? You just steal it. What is this? Yeah, we have. I I would say I I bet there was more to this dialogue, and I bet they be kind of go back and forth a little more. Like I don't know you. Who are you, people? You know, doing doing this. Yeah. So we go from this very intimate conversation with Jesus. Um, talking to the disciples, we have then the disciples and tying the donkey, talking to these bystanders, maybe the people who own the donkey as well, saying, why are you taking this? And then we move to this other sort of conversation. What's this third, third um, conversation? <laughs> The many people in the crowd. Yeah. We don't know who they are. Yeah, exactly. This nameless crowd, you know, who who knows that they may be, you know, maybe they've been supporters of Jesus, or maybe they're just saying, look at this party, isn't this fabulous? You know, and 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 joining in, um, you know, saying Hosanna, blesses the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Um, really, you know, bringing together this celebratory parade um, into Jerusalem. So it's kind of it's kind of a one sided conversation, but it's still this conversation um, between the people communicating with this sort of that you know seemed rock star person, you know, who they're kind of trying to figure out who who is this Jesus, um, and likely many of those who I mean, you can imagine the. People who were maybe at the feeding of five thousand, the people he was, you know, preaching at in the temple, all the many people who he's um, communicated with over the course of his three-year ministry. 
So what happened to Jesus? What was the spirit of these sort of final conversations as we enter into Jerusalem, as we enter into Holy Week? We can kind of think back to some of the words that we named earlier as well. Preparation. Preparation, yeah, getting ready. There's something that's about to happen. Not everyone necessarily knows, you know, maybe. Um, but there's there's this planning for, for what's to come. There's a unity, the common ancestors of David. Yes, yes, yeah. We have this this togetherness in that, yeah, of that we're all we're all sort of in this together and figuring out what are we going to do next, which I think is really beautiful before the sort of disbanding of everyone, you know, happens before we move into the week. I wonder if they, I wonder if they felt anticipation, if there was a different feeling <clears throat> to Jesus' mm -hmm. words than there had been previously, because now all those people are lining up and they must have felt something's happening. Yeah, maybe some sort of sense of urgency mm -hmm. or something, or trying to figure out like, oh, this is different. This isn't like the miracles that happened before. This isn't like all the conversations, you know, at, at table that we've had, you know, this is, this is different. Dramatic tension. Dramatic tension. Yeah, I know. I I love the, the sort of climax of the stories, and this is definitely, you know, one of those before we kind of dip back down. Yeah, absolutely. What's with the ending of his three-year ministry? So yeah. a lot of people know him at this time. Yeah, exactly. In some sense, this is almost a graduation of sorts. I don't know, you know, some sort of the culmination of all of that. Well known. Yes, yeah, yeah. We um, we know the obviously the big picture, mm -hmm. but it always freaks me out. For me, Holy Week is I mean the way the way they just turned turned on him mm -hmm. and their fickleness just made me and it makes me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And maybe it reminds me of myself. I don't know. Yeah. How, I, how you can be just so gung ho mm -hmm. one minute and then so. Whatever. Yeah. So no, it's addictive and cruel. And... Anyway. Yeah. No, it, it's a hundred percent true. You know, and we, I mean, we really can't place our. You know, we we'd like to think we were the ones who walked alongside Jesus towards the cross. We we're there you know, the whole time, but truly, when you know, when your bodily harm, you know, is possible, it, of, of course you're not save yourself, you know, because you want to keep living. Um, and so, you know, at this point, it seems rather safe, right? You know, there's so many people who are celebrating this Jesus. Okay, that seems like it's a safe place to be. I can be hanging around and doing it. But once the officials come in, once the government comes in, you know, I probably would be too hiding under, you know, in my house, you know, wanting to, you know, save myself from, from what was to happen. Yeah, but it's hard for us to, it's so, you know, we feel like, oh, I don't want to be like those people. You know, I want to be, you know, at the cross, you know, with Jesus. Um, but more likely we're not, you know. <laughs> I wonder how Jesus felt. Did he really know mm. what was going to happen? Yeah. Then did he know? And if so, did it come across yeah. in his words to, to the same disciples that heard him? Mm -hmm. Other times, was he, you know, it was this becoming evident to him? Yeah, hour by hour, and how he got changed the mm -hmm. dynamic. Yeah, was he afraid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we so we're gonna look at a, a scripture which gives us a little clue into that in a minute, but there is this question of how much did he know? How much or did, did he know everything? You know, and we really we'll never know, you know, but we can glean some things from. From the scripture about the they have no more, you know, than thing like thing. All right. I want to make sure we have a little time just to think through some of the um scriptures throughout Holy Week. So we 
have this, you know, this culmination, you know, this, this fantastic celebration, which we will also about have in uh, T minus uh, about 45 minutes um, in our sanctuary. Uh, but then we lead into some quieter moments. And if you look in the Gospels, you'll see that there's there's a lot that happens in between Palm Sunday and the resurrection. We unfortunately don't have all the weeks in the world to look at all those conversations. Uh, but he was doing a lot of healing, a lot of teaching in between that we don't often, you know, we, we only have so many days in Holy Week, so we can't look at all of them. Uh, but there's a lot more conversations going on um, in between. Uh, but a couple of those include um, those, you know, a couple of days right leading up um, to the cross. So um, here we have this is from Luke 22, 18, 18 through 20, um, where Jesus is um, breaking the bread um, with the disciples. So I'll just read a little bit of this. Um, then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Yep. So this was, this has never been said before. You know, for us, it's very familiar. We hear it at least once a month. It becomes 8 a.m. You hear it every week, um, the, the words of institution. Uh, but this would be the first time that, that Jesus is having this conversation with the disciples, where he is saying this sort of metaphorical thing that they might have been, confused about how do you think you would have responded from hearing these these words where are you going where are you going yeah what what right here what yeah we're, we're here at table what, what you gotta take off like what what's going on yeah absolutely <laughs> This business about the letter, right? Yeah. And that's that's kind of a strange phrase, right? It's my blood. Yeah. What yeah. It is so. I mean, if you really, it's it's very hard. But if you really take yourself out of this, and you know, here are the words, you know, seemingly for the first time, you know, I wouldn't find really a whole lot of correlation between death and our meal. I mean, aside from, I mean. No, now you know our, our you know, we have communion every day, but and that's I, I would say, well, meals are more for conversation, for celebration, for being together. What is this talk of death? You know, what what is this to, to these are, come? These are words of farewell. Yeah, 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 exactly. Which and doesn't really they're thinking, well, if Jesus goes, what's that mean for us? Yeah, yeah. Are we? Left to continue this? Are we supposed to? Are we done here? You know, or you know, what what's next? Well, I, I and this is Sam. I I I also see it as as words of transact uh, transition in the relationship that Jesus has to all those that are present there. So there's going to be some transition in that relationship. Yeah, yeah, we're we're seeing the shift, the change before we and great segue, Sam. Before we get. To the garden so we have this this movement so all the you know we have palm sunday where we have a celebration and then we have some more conversations with between jesus and the disciples and more teachings that he's fitting in before um before he gets to the cross but then after after this after the the last supper and a whole bunch of other conversations are going on between you you know we have judas we have peter denying jesus um, and we have all these other conversations going on, but then we get to one of my favorite little um, tiny conversations, which is very intimate between um, God and Jesus. Does anybody want to read this one verse for us? Going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not what I want, but Thank you. So kind of what you were talking about earlier, you know, we have this, well, we have, even Jesus is saying, well, 
maybe this doesn't have to happen. You know, I mean, he knows intuitively that it does, but, you know, he's also a little bit of bargaining is going on here. If we read the whole scripture, he's also very frustrated. Does anybody remember what's going on with the disciples in between this? It's very difficult. You know what's going to happen. Yes, yeah, exactly. Can I come in? Yes. Yeah, yes, definitely. Does anybody um remember what else is going on with this? What did what did the disciples keep doing as Jesus is praying? What what Martin? Falling asleep. Falling asleep. All the disciples keep falling asleep <laughs> while he's praying. All he's asking the disciples is to stay awake, pray with me, be with me. Because he's going through a really hard time, but the disciples are human. I probably would fall asleep too. <laughs> and, you know, they're up late, you know, praying to God together. Um, and so Jesus has this, you know, intimate moment, really the last moment where he's alone with God, with his father, um, as he, you know, before he prepares to, to go. Well, if they had a full Passover meal. Yeah. Then they, then they go through this. But yeah. Another round of drinks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't quite understand what yeah. the uh, disciples may have trouble saying. Oh, yeah, totally, totally. And their wine was much, much higher alcohol than our wine. So I could see that, yes, they would be falling asleep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but Jesus is still upset, you know, as because he knows what's coming. They don't know what's coming, um, but he, he can, you know, he wants to be with his people, you know, with as before he, he goes to the cross. So moving to Good Friday. So I, I wish we had you know, an hour for each of these, but we don't, and that's okay. Um, we have the seven last words of Jesus. So this is after um, he is taken away. This is um, after all, all this communication with the officials, with Pilate, um, and then we get to the cross. And we hear these seven last words. Does anybody want to read a couple and then we can we can popcorn around? I'll be happy to. It's Linda. Hi, everybody. Um, Father, forgive them. They know not what they wait a minute, this picture's blocking my word, what they do. I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Woman, behold your son, behold your mother. I thirst. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is finished. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Thank you, Linda. Mm -hmm. Which of these, they are called the seven last words, they're really seven sentences, but which of these sentences kind of hit you the hardest or are most meaningful to you in some way? For me, it's Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Mm. I mean, it's incredible to ask for forgiveness when you're suffering like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Because, I mean, That's... you could be really angry and, and uh, upset, you know. At, at that <laughs> For me, it's the one question, number five. Mm. Yeah, it's so heartbreaking. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's to me that's the most heartbreaking is that Jesus feels that he's completely alone, that God isn't even with him. You know, uh, it is finished. Mm -hmm. It's that much at the end. Yeah. When you say, okay. Mm -hmm. I don't have to battle. I don't have to fight anymore. Mm -hmm. The work is done. Yeah. I can lay it down. Yeah. That, that's very important. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. We get this sort of, I mean, there's so many, as anybody who's dying goes through these different ups and downs, um, especially in this way, you know, he, he'd be asking questions, you know. Physically, I'm thirsty, you know, but then ultimately, okay, we're, you know, the task is complete and, and he's about sort of to die.
I've always been curious uh, as to why Jesus would have thought that his father had forsaken him. Mm. Um, I, I, I um, I, it just has never connected with me that um, he would have that kind of feeling of despair at that time. Obviously, in pain, about to die, all those other kinds of things on the cross, but but um, thinking that it was him being forsaken has always confused me. Mm, yeah, it, it is, you know, especially since, you know, we know that there's this deep relationship between, uh, deep is not a chronic word, but, you know, a huge relationship between Jesus and God. Um, but it seems but to me if you're going to recognize that Jesus is human. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you, you have to. If he said, okay, God, we're in this together, let's go. Yeah. I'd mean, yeah. say, no, he's not human. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that, that's the one that indicates his human. Yeah, maybe it's this this balance. Yeah, Marnie, what is um, I think I find it comforting because when I have felt forsaken, yeah, to know that Jesus felt forsaken, yeah, he understands that yeah. I am crying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We we can, Jesus really does understand us, you know, in, in all the emotions that we might be going through. If he also on the cross is going through all these different emotions. Yeah. Yeah, Our confession says he descended into hell. Mm. And for me, hell is the separation. The separation from hell, yeah. And so I think that is an echo. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think there is something between that of maybe that's yeah, you know, this going from God, not being, not having God to live with him. Did you all ever have a seven last words service here where you had seven preachers, seven? Does anybody have we had that here before? Maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe a long time ago. Um, in the last couple of churches that I've been in, we've had these seven last word um, services where a little homily is preached for every one of these. Um, and I have to say there were some that were way harder and, and we were like, no, nope, we don't, you know, whoever we had to pick, we'd be like, no, I don't want to touch that. Um, and I I think the, my God, my God, why are you forsaken me was always the last one to go. Like no one might touch that one. Um, the I thirst, even it is finished into your hands, I commend my spirit, we're all the ones to go first. <laughs> it was just easier in some ways to, to preach on those texts. All right. So we are going to move from Good Friday and get a little preview of our of next Sunday. Um, anybody want to read this one really quickly? Oh. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, who carried him away? Tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means my teacher. Beautiful, thank you. So. Now we're at the, the real time of the story, right? We, we've totally moved through, um, for us in about 10, 15 minutes, the whole narrative. Um, it's about Easter now? Yes, yeah, we've moved to Easter. So we started with Palm Sunday, moved all the way through Holy Week, and now, now we're at Easter. Cool. Yeah, I know. Isn't that wonderful? We got that all done. Best <laughs> um, So, what is going on here? What what feelings do we have as we move into this last text? Another example of not recognizing him when I mean, he's right in front of you. Yeah, yeah. And it keeps happening to people, so I guess it could happen to me too. But I, I wonder, like, how come they, how come she didn't know that was him? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's like, why don't you see it? May you know, there was probably something that we don't, you're, we're not aware of. You know that there was a, a veil over her eyes, so to speak. You know of, of who, who this was in front of her. 
But it, it is a reminder again and again that we may not recognize that God is speaking to us, yeah. you know, and, and isn't that comforting, you know, that Mary, who, Magdalene, who was with him throughout his whole ministry, didn't recognize her own teacher who she had just seen three days before. <laughs> but it took a conversation from Jesus back to Mary in order yeah. for Mary to recognize who he yeah. was. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head, Craig. It was a conversation. It's all these conversations that help us to realize who Jesus is. Yeah, we can. I was just going to say that she, she was in such deep grief. Yeah. And I think when we're in that place, we just, we can only see our grief. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's, if, if, you, if you've ever experienced grief or if you know someone who has, you know, you, it's kind of tunnel vision of, let me get these things done. Let me do this. You know, you're and you're not you're not really even interacting with the people around you necessarily. You're just you're focused on well, we we know the resurrection very well. Yeah. They did no, no. So I mean, she knew he died and that was it, you know. There's no concept. Yeah, 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 exactly. Can I say something about communication and why the crowd may have turned on Jesus? Because the news traveled by that and word of mouth, person to person. Yeah. And it's easy either deliberately or accidentally to get a direct change. Mm -hmm. It goes from person to person and all this. Like, yeah. They don't repeat it the same way, it will deliberately change. Mm -hmm. I like artificial intelligence. Thank you again, the truth. You changed it. Yeah. Yeah. And we certainly, with all the writing, you know, we don't know everything exactly as it might have happened. Um, well, it's, it's, I'm just saying this is what might have torn the crowd against mm -hmm. them. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, oh, I was just going to comment that. Uh, you know, she was weeping. She wasn't mm -hmm. really even paying attention. No. And so I, I wouldn't have recognized him under those circumstances. I've been in such deep grief that my brain didn't work for maybe a year. Yeah. And oh, yeah, absolutely. And this is so immediately after. Here's such tenderness in Jesus said all over to her. Mm. Just turn me. Yeah. He knows her by name. Yeah. And just calls her into the person. Yeah. We can't even imagine what that must have felt like to hear those words, right? To hear our resurrected or you know, after after everything that's happened. All right. So we're gonna have our own sort of conversations here in a minute. Um, we've had so many different conversations over the past weeks, um, but I'd like for us to think about what are the ways that we communicate with God. So we saw in this many of the conversations that Jesus had with God throughout Holy Week. Now I want us to think about what are the conversations that we are going to have over the course of this, this coming week um, together and individually throughout our services or um, in our own meditation. So what are ways that you most often communicate with God in your own life? What are some of the prayer? Ways? Prayer, yeah, absolutely. Appreciating nature, walking outside and just stopping to marvel at a bird or yeah. a flower pushing its way through the cold ground. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's just it's miraculous, really. Yeah, and its own own act of communication, you know, through that. You know. Doubt. Doubt. Yeah, we had the, our whole theory about doubt and faith. Yeah, absolutely, which really helps us deepen our faith even more. I think uh, being with small children or taking mm -hmm. care of someone. Yeah, being with small children. Absolutely, Linda. They have their own own way of you know communicating with God you know, through through seeing seeing the world through their eyes and being mm -hmm. I'm aware I don't know 80 80 or 90 percent 
of my communication with God is I, I call it think talking, mm -hmm. which is not the same as sometimes even audibly talking, uh -huh. trying to have a conversation with God. I'm in my head almost all the time, mm -hmm. which is not the same. Mm -hmm. If you know what I mean. I guess you have to know one to be one, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's kind of sad a little bit. But well, anyway, anyway. But I, I think having God is still there, you yeah. know, in, in I mean, in everything that we do, but maybe in some ways, most especially when we're alone and we need God's presence more with us. God inside you is wonderful. Yes. <laughs> yeah. For me, one way, it is basking in happy memories. I mean, Easter happens, Holy Week and Easter happen once a year. And in my prayer time, in my quiet time, I reflect back on Holy Weeks and Easter's in my past and mm -hmm. how God touched me uh, during those times. So, we all have a history. We all have a history that is uniquely our own. And I, I think seeing God's hand in my personal history is is just amazing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That we can draw upon these memories and sort of strengthen us in some ways um, is really, really beautiful. Yeah, thank you, Craig. All right, so... We're going to do, do some work together. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you to get up and take over on our table. You'll see a whole bunch of scissors, which I think I almost have enough for everyone. But if not, we're going to alternate with our activity. Um, I almost asked you all to bring scissors, but that was like, you're all going to think that we are, we are not going to. <laughs> um, if, if there's somebody having to do with scissors. Um, so grab a pair of scissors two pieces of colorful paper, whichever color you want, and one white paper. So three papers, two colorful, one white, one pair of scissors, and a pen. If you can take take a second and do that, that'll be fabulous. <laughs> and then for those online, you can get a couple sheets of colorful paper if you can have it. If you don't, white works good too. All right, everybody got their supplies. Thank you, you all are so quick. I love it. So we're gonna look at another mode of communication, which if all of you have endured my five-week series last April on art and faith, you get to endure it a little bit more. <laughs> so this is my favorite mode of communication, which is um, you know, thinking about, you know, how can we communicate with God through the visual arts, uh, both through um, viewing art, but also making art. We're not gonna be viewing art as much today. Uh, we're gonna be making something in just a minute. Um, so we're going to look at that through um, the work of Henry Matisse. Anybody familiar with Matisse? A lot of us in the room. Um, so Matisse, who um, he was a world-renowned French artist, um, known for his um, contributions to modern art, um, especially at the turn of the 20th century. Um, his approach to um, color, form, and composition left um, a, a real mark on the art world at the time. And he's regarded as one of the greatest colorists of the 20th century. Some people say he's, he's the best, although I would I'd say there are some other good colors there too. Um, these are the works, these are kind of his, his more famous ones. Um, which is no more for, for painting, for um, this um, movement called Fauvism, which means wild beasts. Uh, it's characterized by these very bold colors which hadn't um, been used before um, and simplified forms. So it, it, a shift from having kind of impressionist, uh, impressionism and also realism into this um, more abstract, but also very colorful um, look. Uh, it's often very non-naturalistic colors that evoke emotion and expression. Um, and these two, I have a picture of like having bugs or something that just went on it. Um, this is what I had, I, I gave um, a longer presentation on him um, with the other uh, church that I was teaching at. And uh, I was like, well, we're going to have to steer some of the imagery in this one because it's not quite appropriate for, for little people. There were lots of little people in the room. <laughs> 
you can see the, the larger one is called the, the joy of life. You can imagine what the cut would be. Uh, <laughs> um, but after later, um, after Matisse um, had some health issues and limited mobility, he turned to what are called cutouts, um, which if you see on the on some of the pages, looks kind of like those. Um, Matisse underwent surgery for cancer in the small intestine that left him bedridden and unable to paint. He still tried to paint um, with this super long brush that, that would, you know, be like way over there, you know, six feet far. Um, but he he found that cutouts were the easiest technique that um, he could still create and work on his craft. Um, so this sort of cut-up technique involved Matisse literally cutting shapes from painted paper. So he had these technicians who would paint these huge swaths of paper, um, and then he would cut out all of these really beautiful little images um, that had never really been seen before in any artwork, um, and then arrange them into a composition altogether. So the arranging was as much a part of it as was the um, cutting of the of the pictures. So for Matisse in his um, work, while he, he was born Catholic, he moved away from the church later. Um, but later in his life, he had this um, wonderful nurse who um, later became a nun. And in her honor, he made this beautiful chapel, um, which you can see here, which he designed with the cutout in the green one. So you'll see here the stained glass uh, with the cutout. So he created all of the images, which were then later created um, for the chapel. So this is, uh, again, some of the stained glass um, imagery that's in the chapel, and also these gorgeous um, chasubles, which um, you can see in their big form hanging in, in the chapel as well. So it went from these cutouts um, of the cross, um, of other images. I don't know if I included it. No, I didn't. Um, he also went through Holy Week and created these images of, of Holy Week as well. So these are a, a few more of his, his cutout imagery, which were in, to me, in uh, this sort of meditative practice, this process of, of uh, an act of, of prayer, you know, this act of meditation of, of, you know, what was it that he was thinking about at this time? Mm -hmm. So we're going to look at some more images for our own inspiration in a minute. Um, but to sort of get into this, this meditative framework, this talking with God through art, I want us to do a little bit of writing first. So we're going to do a little bit of prayer writing. So get out your white sheet of paper and pen. And then I invite you to grab a hymnal underneath your chair. If there's not, if there aren't some in the back, I can bring some of these up for you. Um, it's our, our little board. Um, and we're going to do a little bit of prayer writing together. All right. We're going to, we have a few prompts. I'm going to skip around. I want to make sure we have time for the art making. Um, but I want to first, all these are going to be pretty short. So the first one is name three objects relating to Holy Week. Three objects. Some might be in the room. That might not. <laughs> oh, we did have palms in here. Never mind. We have we have something on the wall though that's been there. So three objects relating to Holy Week. All right, we're gonna go ahead and move to our next one. So name three words that come to mind when describing Holy Week. So adjectives, three words that describe Holy Week. All right, as we move from those words describing Holy Week, write a one sentence prayer for yourself for this Holy Week. So you can be asking God for something, whatever, whatever you'd like to write about for, for this Holy Week, a, a very, very brief. All right, so you finish up that prayer. We're going to move to our colored paper. So I want you to take your colored paper out. And with that paper, we are going to write a prayer for our church for this Holy Week. 
And so you have two choices with this. So on the other sheet of paper, for those of you in the room, we have an example of a cutout. But you all see on our images a lot of other example cutouts um, as we tasted. And I want you to either, you can either write your prayer first and then cut out around it, or first cut out the, uh, the whatever shape you'd like, and then write the prayer on that cut out. So either one, and I think we may actually have enough scissors so we can all just do one or the other. <clears throat> uh, but I want you to, so it will look like, and, but you can create whatever you want, something like this and then have your prayer written on. And this is prayers for our church for this Holy Week. Um, as we go into Palm Sunday now, as we um, go through on Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter, um, and then when we're finished with that, then we'll, we'll arrange them together. And then I might just take those and create something with that. We'll, we'll see what happens. So we'll take, we have about five or six minutes. All right, friends, what are some of the prayers that you have for us for this Holy Week? I know you put a lot of them up already, but what are kind of some of the general things that you were thinking of you pray for one another into the Easter season? My word is gentleness for this year, and I thought, well, oh, I have to put that on here. Oh, I love that gentleness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we could all use some right. gentleness Patience. for each other. Yeah. Yeah. Was that your star word or was that yes, your chosen it was word? My star word. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It came to me. Yeah. Oh, I should put that on. Oh, I love that. That's <laughs> wonderful. Any other words or prayers that you all have for the Easter season? Thank you, Jesus, for surrendering yourself to God's will to save us from sin. Yeah, it's, it's a big deal. <laughs> yeah, and definitely a, a prayer that we can also pray for ourselves. <laughs> Any other prayers? And then I know we, we got to get over to see a Palm Sunday parade in a minute. <laughs> Burn within our hearts the joy of new beginnings. New beginnings. I love that. I love that. That's beautiful. All right, friends. Well, we have to head on over, but thank you all for this. And I'm going to put this all, I'm going to put it on a bigger, bigger sheet. Um, and you might see this hanging around next next Sunday. We'll see what happens. Maybe we have we do, oh yeah, that's right. We do not have class next week for Easter. Um, I expect you all be getting all beautiful and, and fantastically ready for Easter. Uh, but then we have John teaching us for five weeks after that. So John, is there anything that you want to say in preparation? If you don't, that's okay too. Well, it's gonna be a little bit of history. A little bit of history. All right. We have a little bit of history for a few weeks after Easter, which we're Good. so grateful to John for doing and excited about. So thank you for doing that. Well, it's gone yeah, over, and I, I'm pretty sure it's a little warmer over in the sanctuary, so you all be able to take your coat off. But thank you.